So I didn't give a title to my talk because I didn't know what I was going to speak. Uh, after listening to all this, uh, I've written down some thoughts. But first, uh, you know, whatever we do in our life depends on, in a major way, with our friends, teachers, students. And I have both sitting here, including my teacher, Professor P. R. K. Rao, and from IIT Kanpur, and the environment, my old colleague, you know, Professor Karnik, uh, some more people will be coming later today. And of course, uh, uh, students. I think, uh, of course, when we work, we work with a team on a focus problem, but the larger environment is provided by, by people around us in a larger way, not necessarily by work who are working with us on a specific problem. So from that point of view, everybody has contributed, given strength. I particularly want to mention Dr. Vinit Chaitanya, uh, uh, you know, with, with whom I worked for 20 years, senior colleague, uh, person with very different ideas, very innovative ideas. And the discussion and the dialogue and strong arguments <laughs> that we engaged in. And that was one part which I learned from my father uh, of constant, uh, you know, one is asking questions that is perhaps natural, but he encouraged that. And then discussions. So that, that has helped. Uh, in wherever I have gone, it has helped me wherever I have gone, wherever, whatever I have done. Uh, and also in my, and of course, Deepti Ji is here, my, you know, Vasu, but colleagues with whom I have worked closely. Also, you know, my wife's name was mentioned by Srinivas, you know, who's a risk taker, um, bigger risk taker than me. So, so therefore, I could take risks, you know, go from one part of the country suddenly to another part, go from Kanpur to Hyderabad, Hyderabad to Banaras, you know, without, uh, with full support. So, and not all the risks succeeded, but, and created problems, but through that uh, intense struggle in dealing with the, uh, problems that came, I think uh, I have evolved. The most important part has been I've enjoyed the journey. And I think created uh, bonds, relationship, you know, which lasts a lifetime. And uh, hopefully beyond. I've been listening to this issue about data and, you know, whatever terms we use, data versus analytics, data versus analysis, practice and theory. Now, these are both parts of reality. As a child and even later, as we go around in life, living life, there is a film that is there all the time. Film that is running. There is a story, there is dialogue, there are scenes. Whatever you have in a film, you have more than that. But at the end of the film, you ask, what did you understand? Oh, I didn't understand anything. There are only events. Then life is incomplete. You lived a life but without any understanding. If we have an understanding, 
then we can enjoy the film better this is my belief and you can also change the film that is even more important what the future film will be for you you can change if you understand to be a human is to have to understand by understanding i mean uh both what can be called as logic as well as bhav feelings both logic and feelings can call it gyan and if you learn to apply gyan you have vivek and when you learn the methods you have vigyan you need all the three so frankly i am a little amused at this debate of data versus theory how can there be life with only data there cannot be except if you are an animal if we are a human being we will ask questions to understand and understand with logic and with feelings and that will shape our world of tomorrow so whether it is nlp language whether it is language or it is flooding of rivers or inequality in society unless we understand we will live in a world of data so called data that will be poor that will be poor we will not be able to enjoy it it will be a flat life with no enjoyment with no happiness we'll lose the meaning of the word happiness and more importantly we will also not be able to change the problems that we see so we will not be able to shape the future when we talk of bias what else is bias oh my machine has learned from data so it has learned all the inequalities all the problems in current society those are the biases so now we can't build a better world because we never learned what is it that we value it's all in my data i did data analytics so i learned the reality with its problems and at some point in time i will even forget what is the problem what the problems are what is the good and the bad not be able to distinguish between them and therefore i'll be condemned to live in a world in which there are all these problems my own feeling is it will never happen because we are thinking beings and we want positives to occur so in this journey of evolution the physical evolution has taken place through evolution of the body and it has resulted in various species and the most difficult thing that has evolved is a human being with a brain that's the most complex uh, physical biological part that has evolved now the next stage of evolution is human evolution or enlightenment so that's why better to use another word so how do we reach enlightenment enlightenment means we will be able to remove all the biases you know inequality we will have inclusion we will have accessibility we will have and even put it more uh better way have affection love etc human values so that is where we are evolving so if you are bound to current data and data analytics we are condemned to all the problems we'll be happy with where we have reached so far but we will not evolve and being a human being we want to understand even though our 
curiosity is killed by the kind of education we are getting today. So that understanding we can't escape from. And understanding requires not just incidents that are occurring in this film, film of life, but understanding the principles, understanding the reasons, understanding the causality, understanding what makes everything come together. So that is understanding. We can't be without it. So, as people today say, artificial intelligence and the danger is that Human beings will have all the physical facilities, no thought. They will not have to do any work. They will not have to think. In that, will that be a desirable state? And it's not, what I'm saying in addition, it is not just an undesirable state. It is also an unhappy state because we are born to understand that is built into us. And without that, we will become, you know, lying in a bed, eating the best of food, watching the best of film, but vegetating. With no notion of what is being happiness also. So, in some ways, I am not planning to speak up to this point. I thought I would not talk on this point, but sort of come out. So when we talk of NLP or artificial intelligence connecting with human society, you have to understand the nature of man. It is space. It is I gathered uh, nature of human being, and what is this conducive environment for happiness? and enlightenment of human beings. All that we do for it is progress. All that we do against it is anti-progress. This is what progress is. This is what development is. So if you violate this, if you go against this, this is not progress. This is not Vikas. A lot of talk of Vikas today, development. This is not development for a human society. So we need to keep that in mind. I had planned to talk on NLP and I talked about something else. But the crowd is here today. Uh, so coming about data. <laughs> It's not the time, it's the mood. <laughs> so what happens? Uh, let's come to brass decks. You want to build better NLP systems. For what purpose? So human beings can have better understanding. Which means all languages. No, there should be no endangered languages. We should all be growing languages. Developing further. And people who use them, technology is available for them. So this clearly follows. I don't have to say, it's an obvious corollary if we say this is the goal of a human being and this is the goal of technology. So we will naturally have to work for endangered, so-called today's endangered languages. And there it's a matter of vigyan Vigyan means method actually, how to do something. Management is part of Vigyan, by the way. Gyan, Vivek, Vigyan. Gyan are your universal principles. Vivek is how do you apply them, wisdom? How do you apply them in real life? And Vigyan is method, how to. So, for endangered languages, what methods will you use? You'll use all the methods. Use rule-based method, we'll create corpus, do machine learning, create technology. Always keep in mind what the technology is for. 
technology is a means technology is part of vigyan not gyan what is it that where i want to reach what i decide how i reach it depending on what state the society is what state technology is and so on so for less resource languages this is what i will do i'll use whatever methods and today uh clearly these will be hybrid systems rule based systems etc if i want to improve the accuracy of current systems which are really not uh many of these systems are not usable for at least economic purpose where lot of where people will be able to use it productively let me put it this way so you want to translate produce good quality translations you don't machine translation systems they are nowhere there so you have fine so you use technology the vigyan as a means for doing it faster easier but the goal is that what knowledge is available in one language becomes available in another so i do that so i do human editing post editing and the idea would be how can i have better quality output now for complex technologies like this they have some very peculiar characteristics you say oh i have reached so much so much blue point score or meteor meteor is a much better system for metrics why don't we use meteor i don't understand so matter of doing hard work and creating uh, sufficient data and tools so that meteor can be used compared to blue which which is not very good for our languages blue still does reasonably for relatively fixed word order languages like english but for relatively free word order languages not so good so so i would use all that and use better metrics use improve the systems again use whatever methods are available and in the current state of technology the peculiarity it has is that it is very uneven uneven with respect to task uneven of course with respect to languages uneven with respect to environment in which things are being used for example you have a speech recognition system i'm quoting figures reported by iit madras you know google score is around word uh, error rate around 85% sorry error rate is 15% accuracy is 85% give or take few points here and there you give it uh, technical material drops to 60 40% of your words are wrong so the technology if somebody wants to use in a systematic way in a cost effective way there is a huge variation sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't work so what would you do say most translators say we don't want to use we will run it to get some pet phrases where we'll have to do some thinking but as far as the translation is concerned i'll type a fresh but people who are lazy say say no no let me cut and do cut and paste and such mid output is full of errors and errors which don't appear to be errors we have missed out on the origin so very serious problem so this is the nature of technology and you want to improve it this is where you know we should learn from nature's evolution that in a, in nature even though lion or tiger is the most powerful animal others also survive wolf survive jackal survive deer survive and what happens in the environment is disturbed who dies first most powerful animal disappears endangered species there are niche areas in physical environment where species thrive 
So there may be niche areas with technology, where niche areas of application where the same technology will work. Maybe we, in India, we should particularly create, identify and use technology in this niche area. So that uh, even though as a society, we are more prosperous today, but we have also become much more, you know, under the accountant who counts how much rupees are spent and what have you delivered. And they want you to deliver every week. Every week delivery, what academic institution has done in the past week? Funding agencies are going up to that. Then they said, they agreed to monthly. Monthly uh, uh, work that you have done, monthly achievements. So you work only on the mundane. You'll never work on difficult problems. So, so even though as a society, suddenly there's huge amount of money compared to how things were 20 years, 40 years ago, you also become very foolish. What do you call it? Penny wise, pound foolish. <laughs> Without going into the sociology of it, why we have reached here. Uh, the, the net result is that there is less flexibility. And there is a drive for, you know, again, accountancy, number of papers, doesn't matter which journals. So if you have produced, uh, you know, 20 papers in three years, that is better than three papers in three years. It need not be so. So huge amount of data, we work on that. So incremental research is promoted. Somehow we have to come out of this mindset to have breakthroughs. And breakthroughs are required with incremental mindset we will not be able to solve the problems which are there. So I talked of less resource languages, then limited accuracy, then unevenness of performance over applications, over domains. Of course, there are other dimensions besides accuracy, robustness, flexibility, Variability in environment, some of which, of course, contributes to unevenness in performance. Now, there may also be new ways of looking at the problem. So, when we look at speech-to-speech -speech machine translation, we assume that the best way to do the work is to have speech-to-text, text-to-text, text-to-speech. When we have speech to text, which are designed for dictation, they've thrown away all the valuable information in prosody. So we actually need a different system. We don't need speech to text. We don't want speech to text. Minimum, what I can say is we want speech to rich text, rich text that encodes prosody, intonation, pauses. Emphasis, you know, ways by which we put emphasis. And these markers are extremely important from discourse point of view. Emphasis, then connecting elements, working, you know, have a flow in the argument that is being presented, all that. So we may need to break the problem into different parts, not just standard parts. So the moment you go want to go to different parts, you say, oh, there is no data. How will, I, how will my machine learn? When there is no data about speech and rich text, what will I learn? How will I learn? Unsupervised learning. Now, what do I want to learn? I don't even know that. So there is no substitute for understanding. Right? There is no substitute for thinking. So we have to understand, we have to understand the problem, what is important, what makes it, uh, you know, what, if you want to build a technology, what do we need to do? This will come out of understanding. And data alone will not give you understanding. Data plus thinking will give us understanding. 
So all this debate about you know machine learning with data and nothing else, data with annotation. Now it's let's do away with annotation. I'm only amused by it, frankly. You go to machine translation in such a speech to speech system, it should not just be text to text translation. It should be rich text to rich text. What do I mean by rich text? It has prosody information in it. What about discourse? Discourse has become very, very important. It always was, except we just had no way of dealing with it in our technology. So we ignored it. We said we'll work on sentences, fair enough. But today, we'll have to take into account discourse. Text to speech, of course, needless to say, prosody will be important. Now comes the question of education, training people. So in the earlier, not this one, but the earlier panel, so said it's a battlefield. In this battlefield, we have to have accuracy and therefore we need machine learning on data, data and data. So I think nothing can be more foolish than that. Because if you have understanding, then we will be able to build systems of the future, which will have greater accuracy, which will be more equitable, which will be available for all languages. And where new methods of thinking would give us new approaches and things that are ignored in the current technology. Like prosody is one example, discourse was another. So coming back, so if you want to talk about, uh, you know, we talked about bias and so on. I'll just give a few terms rather than, there's no, I wouldn't want to go into detail at, uh, here. One is the transparency of systems, explainability. We understand what the system is doing. And if you don't understand, system explains why it has done something. This is going to be absolutely crucial. Explainability for what purpose? When experts meet, when human beings meet, they have a dialogue, they discuss come to a common understanding. When 20 people meet, there may be 20 opinions. After a discussion, they converge to something. And hopefully that is a result of collective application of mind. This is democracy. Democracy is not voting. We have reduced democracy to voting. Voting is the method to reach there. It's important as a method, but democracy is about dialogue, common understanding, common decision making. So this democratization of work, I think this term, uh, we understand the way in, it, in, in which it was used, but it is missing that crucial element that democratization should really, it means that everybody thinks and we think together. Sometimes we may not have a single opinion, we may have multiple views, but then we agree that in terms of action, this is what we will do. And we will work together for that. And then the real life will tell us what works, whether it worked or it didn't work. If it didn't work, then we will try something new. We'll again have a discussion and try something new. Now, the moment we talk of discussion, it means we should know why. We should have an understanding of what has been done. So language, which is so crucial to us, I believe for being a human being, language is the most, the critical ability. 
thinking, of course, but the critical ability. It is not fire and it is not wheel, it is language. So language allows us to talk to each other, come, have discussion, reasoned arguments, communicate, of course, not just ordinary facts, but communicate our views and then have a discussion. So this is where, this is what the language allows us. So when we build language technology, if we lose that, we build a language processing system, which is used by civil engineers, biologists, everybody, and the system says, no, I don't understand anything. I have data analytics. I have... It will be a very major loss. AI, which does not able, AI system that is not able to give reasons. Uh, in time to come, society is going to ban that. It will be considered an unethical and it will be a crime to build any such system, which cannot explain itself. It cannot argue why it has reached that conclusion. There was there the, this judicial academy where they train, have refresher courses for judges. And it's located in Madhya Pradesh, so National Judicial Academy. And they asked me to give a talk. They are considering AI. They said, no, no, yes, we have decided not to use AI. We understand. So use AI systems for judgments. But you know what? They said people are going to give build AI systems. The companies are going to build AI systems for judgments, judiciary. Our judges are overloaded. It will be very tempting for them that when a case is being heard, this AI system is also hearing the case alongside the judge. And the judge asks, what do you think? And the AI system says, hang the man. Based on what he says, why? I've used data in it. All my data are such you know, billion cases I have considered. This is a conclusion I have reached. This is the judge will be very tempted in the absence of time to take such decisions, accept those decisions, maybe not for execution, for death, death penalty, but for a whole lot of cases. And then a point will come where we have fallen off the cliff where we will say it's now the system that will decide. There is no need for the human judge. So transparency, self-explainability are key properties that will be required. And if you require them very clearly, these will be systems that will have to have some level of analysis, understanding and so on. Bias, I've already talked of, if we want human society to evolve, not remain stuck where it is with the current biases, then we'll have to have an understanding of what it means to be free of prejudices. I use the word, stronger word, prejudice. And that will require that if you have AI systems, they better understand what are the prejudices and what prejudices got built into them when we did data, machine learning with only data, with no theory, with no understanding. Diversity versus uniformity, there's another principle. So transparency, evolvability, enlightenment. Second, third, diversity versus uniformity. Diversity is what makes evolution run and run faster. It's an evolution's way of having many possibilities and protects, and this protects from disasters because certain ways of doing things become dangerous. So you say, okay, such ways of thinking or, or doing things better be changed. So if guns come, then you have to have different ways of doing things. And if you have atom bombs, you have different ways of doing so You'll have to 
understand the when you when there are diverse options available diverse ways of doing things available becomes a lot easier to move forward and progress evolution has done that many species you know at various points in time there were many species uh, coming out of one let's say a single parent species some survived and some didn't this was nature's way of protecting life so diversity protects against disasters makes systems robust so di- different ways of doing things based on understanding that will come naturally and fourth one okay let me say simplicity and just stop here Sim- explaining simplicity is very hard is a little harder but as we build more and more complex systems which are which even for their normal working depend on everything else they bound to collapse so as we build complex social systems complex technologies they collapse corona is one example when covid 19 came whole lot of things became suddenly extremely difficult the complex systems actually shut down the complex systems of uh, global transfers of materials and production they shut down and these are local things which took over so local and global both have a role global thought but local action so simplicity here today i will say about simplicity and simplicity comes out of understanding so knowledge and understanding and human being that's built into us we can't now remove it also we are born with curiosity curiosity means what you want to understand why so we are built into that and if we come to a vegetative existence because of ai and ai people will say see you don't have to do any work everything is provided for you but that's a vegetative life so if we connect with the human uh goal and that goal happily is part of our happiness we need to understand that and if you understand that that is our goal so education is the goal understanding that's very intrinsic very basic so that is the goal when do when you do machine learning machine learns actually doesn't learn machine never learns machine learns some technique what about you you didn't learn anything about the domain maybe you learned about techniques but you didn't learn anything about the domain so if you say i am a nlp i am a language researcher but i do only machine learning i don't understand anything myself so you can understand and now you do this for every area of human activity then you are finishing off the human being so so let me stop here thank you Uh, uh, Professor Sangar, um, how do we manifest this uh, understanding in an AI system? Maybe in an NLP system, how do you manifest it? I mean, it has to give birth, it has to sustain itself, and it has to evolve as the time goes. so certain things you can manifest certain things are not manifestable but that will take us to a different debate so will machines 
ever feel because I said understanding is both logic and feelings. So will machines ever have feelings? Not possible. So that, that dimension will not be there ever. Not a limitation of technology. It's a limitation of the nature, nature of feelings. Then you come to consciousness. So what about consciousness? You have, would have seen the Searle's argument, there is no consciousness in machine. Okay. So, but, but that will, I know, take us to in a different dimension. But what you ask about manifestation, not talking about feelings and not talking about consciousness. So then, it's one of the manifestations will be in performance, accuracy, also be in robustness, dealing with different situations, different environments. So those would be manifestations. But they are, they would not, they would be missing the feelings and the consciousness dimension. Rajiv, uh, actually when Raj Reddy uh, developed his uh, systems in 70s, um, speech recognition systems, he never called them as speech recognition systems. They are called speech understanding. understanding. I, I, I think it has, the reason is very clear. I think you have also mentioned the, the incorporating the knowledge somehow, whatever little you know, into the speech data is understand. So that is why, although actually accuracies were mentioned at the time, but there was no competition for accuracies. There was only the idea is to build a system which can capture this so-called, they use the word knowledge sources of, uh, in the case of uh, language. So so-called knowledge sources into the speech system to develop an understanding system. In fact, uh, the idea came in speech first because the knowledge sources are very clear. And then they, they use the same wording thinking that they have a similar knowledge sources that they can inc incorporate into image. That's why the rest of the system they built, they called it image understand systems, although it doesn't gel well, the terminology when compared to speech. Speech, it is very clear. But in the case of image, it's not that clear because you don't know what knowledge you are talking about to invoke on the images. Uh, so, sir, I want your opinion on uh, a very uh, actionable that I mean on maintaining a sounding point. So, as I teach NLP, uh, I think uh, in a semester long course of about 40 lectures. Sticks uh, and understand many other things. But only, I think it's an actionable point. So we can the issues can change, but important thing is whether you teach the philosophy or not. No matter what subject you are teaching. And philosophy should come early. Rather, it should slow doses should keep coming as Professor PR Kero. So when, when we are talking of techniques, we also talk of some philosophical point. So very, very important to have the philosophical grounding and an understanding of what we are learning, what is its larger, what is its role in the larger picture. That is missing, frankly. Professor Sangar, I have a question about explainability. Whenever I try to, and your advice of that, so whenever I try to advocate uh, that we really need to have explainable system, which even lay people can understand, the counter argument that I am uh, confronted with is, uh, you travel by plane, do you, can you explain to me how a plane 
works? You travel by a car. Can you explain to me how a car works? And a lot of people say that you really don't need to understand how a system works to derive large-scale benefit from it. So what would you, you say to those people? I have people? dramatic examples of this. Uh, I taught a course in ethics and AI this time. But this example I've used earlier also. So this uh, recent crash of this Ethiopian airliner, right? Where the plane took off. The pilot is saying, raise the nose. The system, computer system in the plane has the audacity to say, you are wrong. I'm going to lower the nose. Okay. It doesn't say it. It just lowers it. It ignores the command of the pilot. And the plane crashes into the earth at, I suppose, 300 kilometers per hour. Everybody dies. So the system there is taking decisions where human inputs are evaluated. Human being is not in control. And before that, people figure out that the another airliner had crashed a year before Malaysian airliner. It was also because of the same problem. So the same Boeing Max, right? All the planes, Boeings are grounded for a year almost. And, and when they learned why the problem was there in the technology. So we better understand technology. Otherwise, technology. Uh, will create disasters. Nobody understands. Somebody understands how the plane works. You don't have to understand. Every passenger doesn't have to understand how the plane works. But somebody understands very well that how the plane works. And that gives you the confidence of sitting in the plane. Right? So we repose our faith on some other people. Which is fine. But if the technology says so, no, there is no need for you to understand. No need for anybody to understand. And there are equally, you know, bigger examples of where, uh, you know, major nuclear accident took place. This is in 79, Three Mile Island. And after that, the impact of that was so great in the mind of American society, not a single Nuclear power plant was built in America. Not a single power plant. But they are selling these power plants to other countries. They realized what are the problems and where the technology went wrong. Rajiv, uh, I think uh, from security and safety viewpoint, ethics in AI is very important. Explainable AI and, uh, you know, proving that it is free of biases and all that. But certain advocates of AI actually have yet another technique called pitting AI against AI. You essentially create two systems and say, is there a flaw in this? Okay. And not everybody needs to know. Of course, some people need to know how it came to this decision. And you can kind of trace back and explain and whatever. Uh, and these advocates actually say, yes, explainable AI should be there. But then they often say we can actually have a gaming system here where to AI actually, and therefore the need for explainable AI or ethical AI and all that is lesser. What do you say on that? You see, when there are critical situations, new situations which have never occurred before, what do you do? You put two systems, two blind systems who are never blind with respect to this new situation. You put them to test and then what do they do? At some point, you will have to have a reasoning process behind it. Ultimate processes actually allow it to do and see what happens. But you don't have that choice. By this competition, you will say, oh, this is better, now select this. Now select that. But in life, there are new situations. And in these new situations, there should be reasoning. 
so if there was a this ai system in the in the plane had a way of saying i am raising the nose i will not allow the nose to be raised because the plane is go will go in a stall that was the reason and when a plane goes in stall means speed starts falling becomes zero then it falls like a stone so 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 the uh, computer systems inside that plane was trying to avoid stall and there was no danger of stall there was something just grossly wrong now they figured out why it was assuming that but the point is you there is no substitute for debate discussion it's not enough to say let's do it and see two systems let's do it and see right we can do better than that if we don't know at all then uh, we have no choice that's what we will we will do and see whether the plane crashes or not but if we have if the if this computer system could talk and say i'm trying to avoid stall the pilot would have told the other pilot this computer system which is now the pilot there is no danger of stall why do you think there is stall so then it is say oh this is the reason he said no this is wrong we have to rise not lower the nose we will hit the ground so there is no substitution for reasoning understanding with feelings that feeling part we will not be able to put ever it cannot be done so the machine remains incomplete but it will still be useful but it will be useful provided we are able to put in these qualities Some non-monotonic. Some non-monotonic. Yeah, other qualities: transparency, uh, evolvability, lack of bias, right? Removal of bias systematically. That is what evolution is. Enlightenment. I use the word enlightenment. So we remove our biases slowly and, and rise higher. And ultimately, it will be simplicity. समथिंग no your solution to a problem is going to be very simple you know right and when you don't understand it well then your solution for a problem is going to be complex you know i think what we need is deep thinkers you know thinking you know understanding deeply something you know brings the simplicity the solution becomes simple you know but then my experience of looking at distributed systems for a long time has been always that they becoming more and more complex you know and uh, they becoming extremely complex now you know in my current role of building something you know i start seeing you know it's really you know very very tricky what can go wrong in your system you know you worry now you know you building this system but then you know you worried any small glitch in it you know to to have ramifications and uh, i think computer systems becoming more and more complex to me looks like a bigger challenge you know right yeah and i don't know whether ai can provide any solutions there because you uh, know some sense i see that you know this too seems to me orthogonal at least for me you know my understanding may be you know you know may not be complete but then that's you know what i i feel you know uh, yeah ai may not have too much to offer in terms of the complexity you know issue i don't know but i would like to hear your views on that you know so judicious judicious use of technology but uh 
when we build social systems, then uh, see there is a drive for efficiency. Efficiency, economic efficiency, currently, but I think an environmental concerns are being raised, so that will also get incorporated. But that is not enough. It is also the human uh, connectivity, human feeling. So we want to build systems that connect us with each other, that develop, that lead to our development of values, human values. They are part of it. So we need to, when we design systems of the future, they will be amalgamation of all this whether they are AI, non-AI, this, that, anything, but environmental concerns and human concerns. Social concerns I'm including in that, lack of bias, equity, all that. Very rarely we design, try to design systems. The economic cost, financial cost, which measures uh, only a very small part, that has become paramount. So, my feeling is as we build simpler systems, they will naturally incorporate environment as well as human feeling. They will be conducive to you know, raising the human feeling. So there is one question uh, online. Srinivas has one. No, there is a question. Somebody joining remotely. It's Srinivas. Uh, can you hear me? Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can hear yeah. you. Yeah, thank you, Professor Sangal. That was very insightful. Uh, I wanted to ask a more uh, sort of take the discussion in a different direction, especially given some statements that you made about funding. As the society itself is more, moving more towards uh, result-oriented metrics, uh, both in technology as well as in society, and we are becoming more product-focused rather than process-focused, how do you see we bring back the idea of process, which is something that you were alluding to in terms of your idea of thinking and understanding? What sort of metrics, what, what sort of methods would you propose to change the current way the society is moving? Yeah, so society has been uh, taken over by Vyapar Buddhi. Uh, money, 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 money. That is a problem. So we are facing that. We'll have to somewhere... If you think of the positive part of money, it tells us, you know, how much resources we are using, for example. Not correctly, always, today. And today, they are getting distorted by the kind of non-sustainable technologies. But otherwise, resource. So efficiency should mean that we use nature's resources as much uh, within the limits and based on what. So there's a way of measuring that. Now, Vyapar Buddhi has come, but there are other concerns. What about social aspect? What about individual human aspect? So they are currently not taken into account or very indirectly. So they will have to be brought in. And today, education has also been taken over by Vyapar Buddhi. So in education also, it is about money. So why are you studying? Oh, to earn, get a better job. So Vyapar Buddhi has taken over. Why has the institution done something? Or it will get more funding. Vyapar Buddhi has come over us. So we are passing through a stage where Vyapar Buddhi has taken over. So we'll have to have other concerns of society, of human development, enlightenment, family. Those are the concerns we must Put him, put them in. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah. Did you uh, 
from this discussion that uh, we have and also the few points you made towards the end, it occurs to me, of course, education is business. There's no question about it. I mean, that's uh, taken for granted. There's no, today. I mean, let us, yeah. today. Not it means we are living on it today. You know, that is the, we have to talk about today only. So the point is, you know, I think it's a very educationist here must think about it. I'm not saying precisely the answer, but at least a point to think. You know, sorry for using a probably a wrong word, but I think I need, I am not able to get a good English word for this. Uh, of this madness of EA and ML programs that we have, okay? Can we de-link? ML and DL can be a separate programs. AL reasoning is a separate program because that reasoning part is extremely important. You see, machine learning and deep learning have nothing to do with AI. They are just machine jobs. Whereas AI, as you rightly mentioned, because it takes a decision overriding the human decision. So that's why AI by itself should not be allowed. If influential people like you can influence, you know, others can influence the society and force that be, we should never use the word AI. Our industry or human being, whatever it is, education, AI reasoning is a course. Be it a contact, whatever you can be there, you can start. But the point is, ML and BA can be in a, a separate course. But people go for ML and BA for jobs, that doesn't matter. But if they want to study AIL, Sorry, AI. AI. AI reasoning is the course, not AI. That is the first fundamental thing, you see. And you know, otherwise, I am really worried about the fact that the EL, AI, sorry, AI ML link, I don't even know how that link has come in the first place. Okay? And I am lost. Every day there is a new program, including IIT starting. You know, AIML, and all colleges have uh, removed the engineering program and uh, computer science, AIML, uh, this kind of. I think you, I know, it's a slightly problem. Slightly problem. And it has to be and, uh, addressed by the influential people, like, you know, all of you big uh, uh, people are in big positions here. Must address the, at least, once it can give you an example. 20 years ago, AICT used to give money for trust areas and uh, research. So colleges never get any money for research. So they were, and they are anyway happy to get money. So one year they announced uh, robotics as a trust area. And they received lots of proposals. And they had some people, they asked me, I was at Kanpur at that time, kindly come and help us. So when we went there, these proposals were stacked on the <laughs> on the floor like this. And as you go through them, and there was a few others, including Professor Mahabala was there. So we looked at, you know, these are people who have never done anything in robotics, but suddenly there are a few hundred proposals. And most of the proposals said, Send the money on this address. <laughs> there was hardly anything in that proposal. So, if you ask me, the larger issue is that the democracy, we've gone into a state where people are not thinking. Institutes are not thinking. That is what Vyapar Buddhi is. No? Money becomes everything. So we are not able to take a decision whether I should have a separate program, mixed program, this, that. Not able to think. Leads to paralysis. That's what has happened. Yes. So larger movement is also needed. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you, Professor Sangal, for your uh, in fact, uh, to summarize some of the things that you mentioned, it appeared to me that you're doing a 
trying to bring a sense of the sacred to the formulation of what the future AI systems have to be. My understanding of sense of the sacred uh, came up in the context of Langa uh, Tapasya Swami Gyanthurup Sanan, who categorically, as an engineer, came out with certain metrics based on which he decided that certain things should not be done when it comes to uh, hydroelectric power projects in the country. Uh, what would be those sense of the sacred is a point that I believe uh, as a society uh, we indeed have to reflect on and your thoughts on the same will be very uh, great. Thank you. Okay. We are happy to discuss it for the next few hours. <laughs> but, uh, you know, these ideas of transparency, simplicity, evolvability, enlightenment, these are the sense of sacred. So if we reflect back into us, we are connecting with ourselves and that is what we are. That is, a, call it the sense of the sacred. There is one more question we take, and then then maybe tea and the uh, problem is that are just tall claims. Like uh, when two persons marry, they get the marriage experience by names. It is not complete. So if AI is applied to predict it, that is good enough. Start making a system that will start helping people decide whether to take a divorce. That is the problem, guys. So, a few times, uh, acceptance of the and then is causing problem. So, some uh, ways of uh, humanistic audit and normal audit, normal audit for systems, etc., are required before uh, things are uh, deployed for solutions. Okay, uh, so thank you, thank you, Dr. Sangha.